morning. <laughs> okay. You're all very welcome here this morning. Now, please be upstanding for the arrival of our president, Michael D. Higgins, and his wife, Sabina. Seven more years, but that is not the topic of our discussion today. There will be no talk of that this morning because we're here to hear quite different things. Now, it's my very grateful privilege to introduce our president as the first speaker in the first thought strand of the Galway International Arts Festival. First Thought comprises the talks, readings, conversations and debates part of the festival and its theme this year is home. We have a broad spectrum of historians, poets, novelists, journalists, broadcasters and visual artists to meditate uh, on this broad ranging subject on what more appropriate person to begin our conversation than the president who has written and talked about identity, belonging, migration, localism, nationalism and internationalism in venues all over the world with immense erudition and to huge acclaim. He and Sabina have created a welcoming home in Oris and Uthron for many of our citizens, from community activists to artists, from the disadvantaged to the advocates for them, from foreign dignitaries to public intellectuals. He has recently declared his attention to stand for a second term as president, and very welcome news that is, and I'm sure we all wish him a benign and trouble-free campaign on his way. <laughs> On his way to what I would like to say is an inevitable victory, but that would be bad luck, so I didn't say that. It is now my great pleasure uh, to ask the President to address us on the subject of home. President Higgins. August eh, Mila Bukas near one of Mahan Hindix, a sunny son of Toy Testalon with Mavan Kayla Savian. Dear friends, eh, may I begin by thanking Katrina Crow for a generous invitation to address the Gold International Festival. And may I commend Katrina eh, and all those who have volunteered and worked on this endeavour for what is a wonderfully curated selection of topics and speakers. And at the outset too, I, among those, and I would like to pay a special tribute to Catherine Corliss, who will be speaking later today at the Aula Maxima, who has demonstrated not only courage and perseverance, but a remarkable commitment to uncovering the truth, the truth, the historical truth, and indeed moral truth. And all of us in this republic, in my view, owe her a debt of gratitude for what is an extraordinary act of civic virtue. I think uh, when I was asked to make this reflection, offer a meditation on the concept of home, I have found it quite challenging. I found it challenging for a number of reasons because it's a lovely Irish thing. People say to yourself, just be yourself. Uh, and others would say to you, as long as you're inspirational. <laughs> and then others would say simply, but the general suggestion was that I would draw on my life in writing, my life as an academic, uh, and my general experience. Uh, this was challenging for me because if I was to draw on my early life that informed my poems to such a degree, those early collections, I would write 
of the loss of home and the memory of the loss of home, of my mother's endless hope for a house that would recover respectability, of the disaster of moving from the city to the country where respectability was more likely, of the good days in a simple house, attached roof, until illness prevented the repair of the thatch, and holes appeared in the thatch and the rain down, and then all of the dealing of all of this, this house to which one couldn't invite visitors, relatives, who suffered their visits. And then also, too, what is in a concept of home for a writer, the importance of escape. I had all of that in my mind, but it requires a longer treatment. And I thought, too, of home in the novel, and home in the long poem, and then home in a colloquial sense. He was at home there, he said. Or again, she would never be at home in such circumstances. They were not, they were at last going home, the soldiers in the trenches. I think as well then, the sentimentalised version of home, my little grey home in the West, home sweet home, and at night the more familiar, have ye no homes to go to? <laughs> I, I think drawing on all of this, because memory for those, and we are at an international arts festival, and I so congratulate them on their 41st, here, is that all memory is textured memory. And I think that is very, very important. And I think the sheer breadth of the theme of First Thought, Thought Talks, Strand of the Arts Festival, it provides me with, a return, with an opportunity to return to and reflect on some of the matters which I also sought to engage with as a university lecturer. And I remember, not quite as large as this first years, where I gave my first lectures on sociology all those years ago, and the Reverend Professor said to me, Michael, they tell me you took it all apart for them. But did you put it back together again? <laughs> now, it would be an absolute impertinence to such an audience to suggest that after what I have to say this morning, that you would be able to put it all back together again. And I think then it was very interesting because those early lectures, I was given the unfavourable slot of nine o'clock in the morning, <laughs> which meant I had to wait ten minutes for the bus to come from Salt Hill to disgorge some of my, my students. <laughs> but then later in the day, I had a better slot because I had a course title. I gave lectures on the sociology of literature, sociology of migration, and a course called Deviance, Crime and Punishment, which drew, I believe, a huge crowd, some of which were not taking my course at all. <laughs> but I think it was it intellectual curiosity, prurience, and was it an attempt to understand their own lives? I never bothered, but I introduced them to Michel Foucault. I offered them to ask them to reflect on such notion that it wasn't the prisons should be reformed, but the prisons had entered consciousness. He was then considered an avant-garde thinker, and to many he was the exciting source of the new sociological ideas on the role and nature of gender, incarceration and crime. And perhaps this might not have what they were expecting or indeed hoping. But I do remember very, very well uh, the response to that. But so today, unlike those lectures of all those years ago, and neither drawing on my biography or my poetic work and what informed it, I will not begin with Foucault, but I do want to make some reference uh, to two other philosophers who indeed influenced Foucault. One is Martin Heidegger, the dreadful Martin Heidegger, whose legacy continues to be haunted by his monstrous moral failings in the 1930s and 40s. He who is not forgiven by the most forgiving of all, Anna Arendt. And the second philosopher is Gaston Bachelard, French philosopher who transformed the philosophy of science in the 1950s. 
And though neither share much in terms of perspective or trajectory, they both offer meditations on the manifold meanings of home. In an essay entitled Building, Dwelling, Thinking, published in the collection Poetry, Language, Thought, Heidegger asked two questions. What is it to dwell? And how does building belong to dwelling? He wrote that dwelling is the basic character of being in keeping with which mortals exist. Dwelling and the processes of building, making, and shaping thus emerge almost as circular phenomena. Even as people create a place, they forge a relationship between themselves and that place, such that they begin to dwell. In Heidegger's words, the relationship between man and space is none other than dwelling, strictly thought and spoken. As a student of migration, I am particularly struck by the implication of that last sentence, as it does, and I think it makes a very unhelpful, even dangerous assumption in favor of the universality of a fixed relationship with a specific space, and indeed, perhaps, with a specific time. Time and space may be fundamental concepts, but I think they wrestle with each other and dwellings emerge, and at their emergence are in the journey towards being a ruin or becoming a memory. I think such a thought, as is suggested by Heidegger, displays a disposition so intrinsic too to a considerable body of contemporary theological work in modern social science. I think what its greatest flaw is, is that it is incapable of encompassing the experience of movement or the richness of the interstices of the space between spaces, where most exciting things happen, as Edward Said wrote. Migration and movement have always been a part of the human experience. Indeed, for some historic peoples, they constituted the very foundation of their social and economic lives. And an obvious example, of course, are nomadic peoples. The life of all migrants, seasoned and settled, cannot be handled by such formulations that are privileging the sedentary. That is not to say, for example, that such people did not dwell not that they did not form relationships between themselves and a particular space. No more than the traveling community who record a space where they camped, for example. Such that it became a treasured place in which a home could be made. But they were never sedentary, not bound to one place or even one identity, often being people of split identities as they negotiated new spaces in different circumstances. Transience, that important concept, requires a near continuous redefinition of home. This is something caught in literature as as much as it is missed in the privileging of the sedentary and the social sciences. In 1958, a number of years after Heidegger first delivered that lecture that would become Building, Dwelling, Thinking, Gaston Bachelard completed a short volume entitled the poetics of space. Though better known for his epistemological work, he turned his attention to what he termed the phenomenology of the imagination, the study of the poetic meaning of the house, and the intimacy imbued within everyday household places, such as the attic, the cellar, or the drawers. And you might remember those of you who visited the Heaney exhibition about where he moves towards different points of creativity. Or indeed Arthur Miller, who moves out of the house to the end of the garden to write his plays. Bachelard in The Poetics of Space wrote, the house is our first universe, a real cosmos in every sense of the word. That it is, he wrote, the topography of our intimate being. And think too of the positioning of the chair near the fire in the Irish countryman of Arnsberg in Kimball. And when someone dies, it's someone else's turn to make a migration to the chair near the fire. That is pure Bachelard. The house Bachelard reasoned 
emerges as the home by becoming a site of intimacy and creativity, of memories and dreams. And what is remarkable is the degree to which in the work of Bachelard, concerned as it is on the face of it with the evocation of the architecture of spaces, home is presented not only then as a physical space, but as an immaterial reality, not a defined place of retreat, but a series of relationships and intimacies with places and between people. And indeed, I would add that in referencing between people, the estimation of the physical form of the house, its status indicates it takes on a role as an indicator of position in the class system, even of respectability or assumed lack of it, requiring for some, for example, the need to manipulate an address for, if you like, entry proposals to life in a class-based society with its petty foibles and prejudices. Is this definition of home then to be a function of residence, simply occupying space with sufficient security, a space from which one can move out to participate, circulate? And how and when does a condition of ownership arise? Is it as a guarantee of a deepened security, occupation being an insufficient criterion of what is home? And going beyond the theme of home then, as a set of balances to what I have described, perhaps between security and freedom, it may be useful to consider, if however briefly, at a most general level, the evolutionary of the concept of our planetary home from earliest times through to the Anthropocene. Time restic restricts a deeper consideration of home in terms of our loss of symmetry between nature and habitation. Yet I believe that this is a perspective that we must seek to recover and uncover anew as we try to wrestle with the consequences of the changes that humanity has wrought upon our shared and vulnerable planet. A planet home now to over 7.6 billion human beings and innumerable threatened and disappearing other animals and plants. These changes that we live with, suffer from today's world, are themselves a product of a very particular type of human civilization, one formed by two great revolutions in economic and social organization, the Neolithic and the Industrial Revolution, both of which produced and reproduced very particular ideas and ideals of home. Ones which in their assumptions stand as background to our contemporary legacy, but sadly are not as open to critique and evaluation as perhaps they should be in a responsible scholarship and citizens' debate. And perhaps this in turn has constrained our capacity to reimagine our collective future today. The Industrial Revolution, usually timed as in the second half of the 18th century, is now understood to have inaugurated what the Nobel Prize-winning atmospheric physics uh, chemist Paul Crutzen has categorized as the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch in world history marked by the influence of a single species, our own, on the global environment. The term Anthropocene has its own distinguished genealogy. It was first used by the Italian geologist Father Antonio St Stopani in 1873. He, in turn, influenced by an American diplomat, George Perkins Marsh, whose 1863 book, Man and Nature, or Physical Geography as Modified by Human Action, was foundational for the environmental movement in the United States. At the core of Perkins' work lay an imaginative analysis of the acute crises of the, sedent the sedentary civilizations of the ancient Mediterranean world, brought about by soil degradation, occasioned by the intensive farming techniques of the Neolithic Revolution, an early example of surplus-seeking affluence provoking an environmental crisis. We can discern in the rise and fall of these ancient cultures a presaging of the Anthropocene. Though not yet cursed with the capacity to radically transform the carbon or nitrogen cycle, these older peoples were still yet able to degrade the environment enough 
to doom themselves to lose their home through a lost symmetry with nature. Theirs was a radically different culture than that which had gone before. It was based not on migration, hunting and foraging. All those attempts to extended family and embryonic forms of political arrangement. It was rather based on the cultivation of the soil and the domestication of animals upon settlement whether in isolated homesteads, clusters of dwellings, or densely populated cities, and above all upon the capacity to transform the muscle and sinew of humans into energy. For the first time since our ancestors, the Homo habilis, emerged six, two million years ago, human beings created cultures focused on a single sedentary space in which buildings such as the temple rather than nature became the locus of spirituality, and hierarchical social relations emerged to coordinate production in Neolithic societies, overseen as they were by a new administrative managerial class facilitated by surplus, often claiming divine sanction, driven by a new, highly gendered division of labor. It is not a coincidence that slavery, the most abhorrent of human institutions, arose in those years, and in a recent work the anthropologist James C. Scott, I have so often quoted, has made in his recent book, Chilling Observation, that the walls erected around settlements in the slave societies may have been built not to keep people out, to exclude those without, but to imprison those within. I do not necessarily subscribe to the Weberian thesis hinted at by such speculations, namely that the foundation of a state, whether historical or in the present day, has and can only rest on violence. After all, the city-states of the ancient world would create over time protean republics, albeit ones marred by systemic and profound injustices. We find in ancient Rome, even in the works of a conservative member of the senatorial class, such as Cicero, a commitment to the ideal of political community founded upon solidarity with a shared commitment to an ideal of justice, however hypocritical the exclusion of slaves, women, and, if you like, and other Italian men from citizenship would later appear. This ideal also suffused the civic life of Athens, finding its expression in the politics of Aristotle and to the orations of Demosthenes. It provided a basis for an ideal of home as a set of relationships and shared commitments rather than a settled place, as important as place was. But this is represented above all by the success of the Athenian statesman Themistocles, who persuaded his fellow citizens to evacuate their beloved city so as to facilitate a unified Greek response to the invading Persian Empire. Even though Athens was burned to the ground, the Athenian city-state continued anew in a neighboring fishing village. Yet this was an ideal of a material home and homeland that was exclusive and profoundly unjust, available only to the small pool of men eligible for citizenship. Strain with Greece, how much can we consider the Greek household, the oikos, from which we derive the word economics, that is when we were studying political economy, or household management as a home in the physical sense? How, much, how can we regard that, the oikos as a site of intimacy and belonging imagined by Gaston Bachelard? It was more likely that it was a place of alienation and loneliness for many members of the household, excluded as they were, women and slaves, from any participation in public life. Even as the concept of the public realm was given form by city-states, so too arose a new vision of the private household, dictated, managed and controlled by the aristocratic patriarch a social construction later given juridical form within Roman law. We might recall the image of the Roman senator controlling households with thousands of slaves in addition to his wife, sons, and daughters. 
the social construction of the patriarch was to prove the most durable, if lamentable, foundation of the Roman world, weathering the disintegration of the sedentary Roman civilization under pressure of countless migrations by nomadic peoples who would in turn lay the groundworks for the feudal order of the medieval world. The political imaginary of that new medieval world was one entirely dominated by ideas of hierarchy, represented by the great chain of being, imagined by the Neoplatonists, connecting the lowliest plants and animals to the heavens, and by the gradual sacralization of the figure of the monarch. Despite all the distance in time and space between medieval France and ancient Mesopotamia, they were both still in so many ways Neolithic civilizations impelled to produce energy through human effort alone. The peasant, the laborer bound to the land, was the archetypal producer in all Neolithic cultures, tied to his homestead, subject to the often arbitrary power of his superiors, whether a feudal lord or a municipal administrator. He and his family, e mixtu manu, he and his family provided through a lifetime of backbreaking toil the material basis for the entire civilization. Exceptionally, the Roman Republic was one of those rare ancient or medieval policies that for a time professed to be a confederation of independent farmers, a community of households and families, each with their own small stake in their country. The house of the peasant was clearly a place of work, one with its own gender division of labour, as women and children carried their own burden of labour not only in ensuring the survival of the family through the historically feminised tasks of caring and cleaning, but through work in the field. And then as the insatiable Atlantic empires of Northwest Europe began to inexorably expand their economic capacity through conquest, the concept of the workshop emerges. For example, as a recent article in the Economic History Review by Jane Humphreys and Benjamin Schneider has su suggested, the massive extent of hand spinning in 18th century England in the 1750s was the largest category of employment, with nearly a million women and children engaged in yarn production, their work constituting over a third of a poor household's income. Such labour was overwhelmingly carried out in workshops in the home, and it was exploitative, as employers owned the materials and simply put it out to their employees to work on and return. Is there not a digital age equivalent? Then came the mechanisation of production which Humphreys and Schneider speculate was a response not to high wages, as previously hypothesized, but to the availability for employment of still more impoverished women and children. This moved the world of paid work from the house to the factory. Social construction of time, of behavior, social and even sexual, were changed by this. The split between factory time which allowed for little discretion, and home where discretion might be recovered, where the family could be reproduced, became emphasized. And it is recorded, I believe, in really so many different aspects of culture of the period. Inventions such as the spinning jenny still required energy produced by the human and animal energy. But for all the sophistication of Neolithic civilizations, whether in medieval Ethiopia or early modern England, they were ultimately constrained by nature and relied on plant life to sustain both people and livestock. That constraint was eliminated in time by the discovery of the ability to convert energy released by the combustion of carbon into mechanical energy. This gave rise to a whole new set of relationships between economy, ecology, ethics, culture and society, and it redefined home. It was one that rested upon a narrow and distorted version of political economy, a vision of accumulation that sanctioned poverty amidst plenty, and internationally an imperialist ideology that integrated the new science and technology of the era in an ideology that asserted a hubris of superiority 
of certain peoples suggested the inferiority of others as inevitable, that regarded the conquered and the dispossessed as at best backward and inferior. In the industrialized heartland of Western Europe, this new industrial civilization required not peasants, but workers, and a new working class emerged in the towns and cities. By the end of the 19th century, skilled workers would be enabled in a mimetic sense to replicate the domesticity of growing professional and mercantile middle class, with women carrying out domestic unpaid labor and men undertaking paid work in the new factory system. The product of work and the worker were now becoming ever distanced from each other. And this is the era in which, going back to my sociology lectures, Emile Durkheim first began his work, which inter alia offered us the concept of anomie arising from his study of suicide. And of course, it is the era in which Karl Marx wrote, to whom the idea of alienation was central. Changes in the mode of production had forced deep changes in the wider context of personal, family, and social relations. And the writings from literature now begin to the theme of a world in which the heroes and anti-heroes and heroines would write of not being at home in the world. It is perhaps not surprising then that it was also the era in which there occurred in legal scholarship, as much in everyday practice, a separation of the idea of home and house, of property and dwelling. For the conflict between ideas of home and property, between dwelling and belonging, was never greater than in the industrial and imperial era. The clash between the assumptions of differing civilizations in conflict would lay the seeds of a harvest that would take a century to ripen. As to the differing assumptions, we need only think of the native peoples of North America and Australia, whose ideals of life and what was envisaged as home were very different from those that had now developed in Northwest Europe. When I visited Australia last year, I did so in the knowledge that such ideas were still a matter of contestation, not least in the aftermath of the Mabo judgment, which finally recognized the interest of the Aboriginal people to the land, at least within the ambit of the common law. The conception of land and of home, of country, held by the first Australians, the oldest surviving human culture, was that the people belonged to the land, as much as the land belonged to the people. The Mabu judgment overturned the doctrine of terra, not of terra nullius, the empty land, a hubristic, monstrous imperialist fiction that the peoples of Australia had no claim, at least under English common law, to the land they had inhabited, dwelled in, and shaped for 60,000 years. The vast confiscation of tracts of land, not only in Australia but in North America, were justified and consecrated by the theories of John Locke, sometimes heralded as the father of modern liberal thought and toleration, although his categories were constructed by exclusion. If his essays on tolerance excluded the Catholic Irish with the memorable phrase that papists are like serpents, Thus did he exclude those who did not farm the land from his theory of the right of property as a natural right. The Native Americans were, Locke wrote, savage beasts. As the Italian philosopher Domenico Lasurto rightly reminds us, the idea that land becomes property by virtue of being mixed with labor was used to exclude an entire continent of people who did not share such a conception of property and whose natural resource management was not considered labor by those who considered themselves settlers. Such a theory of property was then the basis for what we should call the great dispossession of home inflicted on the peoples of America and Australia. Coming closer to home, David Hume in 1767, in his history of Great Britain, had written, the Irish, from the beginning of time, have been buried in the most profound barbarism and ignorance, and as they were never conquered, even invaded by the Romans from whom all the Western world derives its civility, 
They continued still in the most rude state of society and were distinguished only by those vices to which human nature, not tamed by education, not restrained by laws, is forever subject. Our own national history is indeed marked by its own great dispossession and the sustaining prejudices of the project of colonization. Even as the conquest and creation of the imperial settler states reached its zenith, and its conclusion in the late 19th century, the conception of home in this country and its relationship to property ownership was undergoing its own transformation under pressure from one of the greatest movements of thought and action ever seen on this island, the land movement. Irish society in the 1870s was a product of the conflicts of the 17th century, of an act of union that would lead to the impositions of a single paradigm of economic thinking as to trade and productivity. And it was but really two decades, of course, on from the catastrophic consequences of the Great Hunger. Ireland was a largely rural society, characterized by a large number of fragmented small holdings, though not as many were farmed on a subsistence basis as on the eve of the famine. At the height of economic and legal relations sat, sat a small number of landlords operating through estate managers or middlemen with intermediate landlords and subletters. The common sense political economy of property ownership had changed in content but not in form as the Lockean idea of property as a natural right had given, away, had given way to the Benthamite idea of secure property rights as the most efficient means to ensure that the owners of capital would maximize the utility of capital. There is a version of this in development theory in the De Soto model of development. Do I not hear an echo of this in present circumstances? In 1848, in the depths of the famine, James Fenton Lawler raged against the idea that property should be inviolable, writing, I acknowledge no right of property in 8,000 persons, be they noble or ignoble, which takes away all right of property, security, independence, and existence itself from a population of 8 millions, and stands in bar to all the political rights of this island and all the social rights of its inhabitants. I acknowledge no right of property which takes the food of millions and gives them a famine, which denies to the peasant the right of a home and concedes in exchange the right of a workhouse. Against that individual right, Fyndon Lawler asserted a still greater right, the right, in his own words, to live in this land in security, comfort, and independence. And now, if his statue stands in his native Port Leisure, and despite the acknowledgement by and his great influence on David Connolly and Pierce, he is perhaps still remains something of a lost prophet. His democratic radicalism, unjustly paling beside the psychologically more easily engaged romanticism of his friends in the Young Ireland movement. Yet it was his idea of home as an inalienable social right and its association with the idea of the nation, of the wider national community as home, that was invoked, whether knowingly or not, by Charles Stuart Parnell, when at a public meeting in Limerick on the 31st of August, 1879, he implored the tenants of Ireland keep a firm grip on their homestead and to join the land war which had taken the form of a nationwide rent strike to secure the historic demands of fixity of tenure, fair rents, and free sale. Beyond the intimacies of home, there is the longing for the security of the dependence within the home to whom it constitutes shelter. It is still somewhat forgotten today that when the male leaders of the Irish National Land League were imprisoned, it was the women who took up the fight, bringing a level of organisation and discipline hitherto unseen in the conduct of the land war, Parnell's sister Anna being the most prominent amongst them. They brought a new and renewed energy and vigour to protest against evictions, and where they failed to prevent families being removed from their homes, they erected temporary shelters and buildings for them. In anticipation, it was hoped, of a return to their homes following victory in the land war. These women were adamant that security of the home and homestead was not, as far as they were concerned, to be subordinated, as it might have been by others, to the prospects of home rule. 
It is significant, too, that the Ladies' Land League, the first national organization of Irish women led and organized by women, as Ginny Wisepower would later remember, sought no small or partial objective, but a transformation set of demands oriented around the protection and indeed creation of home. Home as a physical dwelling and shelter. Home as a place of security and safety. And in doing so, they redefine the very vision of what the wider national home could be and what it should seek to be. I do not wish to necessarily revisit the history of the land war or the manner in which vast amounts of land was redistributed through the successive land acts. To those who were in many respects the most powerful of the tenant farmers, with a variety of forms of house and home, it's for another day. Even as those in margin lands or landless labourers continued what had become a familiar pattern of emigration. Political economy does matter. The assumptions which guide and generate policy instruments, the assumptions of differing versions of political economy feed policy. And I would like to reiterate a point, a point I made during a lecture I gave at the University of Melbourne last October when I reflected on the influence of Irish political economists in Australia and Ireland. It illustrates how an instrument can have different outcomes and be defined by its historical setting. In the 1840s, an Irish disciple of the economist David Ricardo, Robert Torrance, emigrated to the infant colony of South America, hoping to establish a new Hibernia in the southern oceans, populated by independent Irish farmers tilling small plots of land. That plan failed, as South Australia was instead caught up in a huge wave of land speculation as land grants issued by the colonial government were rapidly resold to such an extent that title disputes were now endemic in the new colony. That crisis of ownership was resolved by Torrance's eldest son, Robert Richard, through the introduction of the principle of registration by title, the defining feature of which is the indefeasibility of title given to the registered proprietor. There is a moral and ethical point here. The torrent system did not only constitute a means to resolve a temporary crisis of colonial speculation, it constituted a legal technology of empire by which to extirpate any claim to title held by the first occupants of the land, who in turn did not share, of course, any of the assumptions inherent in either common law ideas of property, whether legal or philosophical, or in the torrent system. Land grants had been issued to colonial speculators on lands that had been inhabited by the first peoples of Australia, and the torrent system guaranteed their expropriation, despite the pledge in the royal decree to respect the rights and enjoyments of the first occupants that had been outlined in the letters patent authorising the colonisation of South Australia. And now the great irony is that the torrent system was extended to Ireland in 1891 in the context of the Land Acts of 1885, 1891, 1903, 1909, which successfully financed the purchase and transfer of the landlord's interest in the land to their tenants. So even as the principle of title by registration was used to dispossess the first peoples of the colony of South Australia, it was used to reconstitute the property relations built over the long centuries of conquest in Ireland, severing the old ties to the land and delivering to Irish tenants unencumbered freehold title. In Ireland, this represented a partial liberation from the past to enable something of the making of home, albeit gradually it was in so much part also saw the emergence of a new hegemonic grazier class. In Australia, it held it a total suppression of the past, marking a subjugation of a concept of home within nature to the new demands of industrial era imperialism. Returning to the idea of the home then as an immaterial reality, as that set of relationships between people and with place, we might gain an understanding of just how traumatic such a rupture and confiscation was, not just in Australia, but for all indigenous people. With what then contemporary questions are we left? Some, I suggest, raise inevitable moral implications. On what terms 
I think, in what areas are markets the appropriate mechanism? On what terms should their presence be regulated? And if home housing is to be a right, in what circumstances does it being a right call for protection, vindication by the state? These are unavoidable moral questions for publics. Standing behind our present debate on housing are all those assumptions as to the role of the state, the neglected topic in political science, the status of essential needs versus property rights. For citizens to choose policy options, they have to be transparent and evaluated in terms of the assumptions they make as to the role of the market and the state and the content of mixed models and their outcomes. We are forced, too, to look once again at our own usage in this country of the idea of home. Those of you attending Catherine Collis' talk later will recognise that for those placed in mother and baby homes, the home constituted a place of incarceration, of loss, of retribution, even of invoked revenge for the breaking of an authoritarian version of birth, life, the family and society. And how often has it occurred in the novel they were afraid of going, being put into a home. It was in the home he died. And then taking all the intimacy argument up when people transport, for example, reluctant relatives and say, have you got your things together? And that movement from space that has been made intimate with objects and relationships and memories, all of this is important. And returning to Bachelard's idea of home as the site of intimacy and of safety, we must ask, has not the private home, the household, that concept so prominent in the inheritance of Roman law, has for so many been a place of oppressive gender relations, the most terrible manifestation of which is domestic abuse. And a many people have sought to escape. As to work itself and its implication for the concept of home, the more quotidian example is, of course, the distribution of domestic labour. And the double burden of working in the market economy and in the household still placed on women. And in this present moment, it feels as if the women's movement has been infused again with renewed vigour vigor and authority. And I so wish that we will continue to make progress by acknowledging the past and continuing to build a better future. This university is fortunate, I believe, in hosting the Centre for Housing, Law, Rights and Policy Research, whose work is so critical to enhancing our understanding of the housing system here in Ireland and its complex relationship with international and European financial and monetary policy developments. The centre is home to scholars who provide a comprehensive understanding of the role of housing. And if I may quote my former student, Dr. Paul Kenner, housing addresses the basic need for human shelter, but also facilitates the essential human requirement for home. I'm obliged, I'm afraid, not to stray any further into details of housing policy in Ireland, not only for constitutional reasons, but also because I am aware that Katrina has assembled an excellent panel to discuss housing in detail this evening. I do, however, wish to make two more general observations, finally, at the level of principle. First, that Dr. Kenner's observation is vital. Indeed, it is a moral truth that reflects the struggle in our history. Even as a residual or minimum response, the Land Acts were, after all, accompanied by a series of Labourers' Acts, which were passed after concerted activism to provide exchequer subsidies to local authorities to construct new housing at fair rents for landless rural labourers in Ireland. Between 1883, the year of the first Labourers Act, and 1914, nearly 50,000 rural cottages were built by local authorities in Ireland, housing over a quarter of a million people. We should not underestimate what a remarkable deviation from the hegemonic laissez-faire verities of the day that this represented. Nor was it a partial victory, however belated it was, for the more emancipatory elements of the Land League, even if the purpose was, in the short term, of not losing social cohesion. That and the need for labour. In Irish cities, local authorities were somewhat slower to make use of the Housing of Working Classes Act, the urban counterpart of the Labourers Act. There was, of course, no legal right to home recognised, 
where a moral right was asserted and it was partially recognised. It was a recognition that home is something greater than shelter, not merely any temporary expedient. It is about the acquisition of the means to belong in community and to participate in society without shame as a mark to sin, my put. There is not as yet a justifiable, justiciable right to ho home as housing in the Irish legal order, though I welcome previous discussions of the Convention on the Constitution on the possible incorporation of economic and social rights. This is a debate that we urgently not only need to continue, but to take seriously and to be deepened by taking into account the work of such as Professor P.J. Drudy, Des Collins, Michael Punch, and others, such as well as Dr. Kenner. It can and should, we should integrate the idea of a home into our law and policy making in a serious way. If we recognise that housing is necessary for the creation of home in our society, we need to think seriously about all the constituent parts of our housing system. I use the term deliberately, system, for the term housing market can obscure the massive and necessary role played by the state through fiscal, monetary and other policy areas in all the various parts of the system, from planning to financing of construction to design, regulation of construction itself, and the various mechanisms by which occupation of a home is financed, whether it be through rent or by home purchase. How many homes should be constructed every year? How should construction be financed? How should living spaces be designed? What mix of housing tenure do we collectively believe is appropriate? What kind of ownership structures, whether it be in a municipal, private or collective? Let us widen the debate and engage seriously with a full range of the policy answers to these questions, being willing to eschew ideological obstacles to the widest possible range of policies. Rereading the White Paper on Housing, published in 1964, was quite instructive. Its historical review outlines how the state decided to embark on a massive house-building programme in 1933 in the midst of the Great Depression. As a consequence, local authority homes constructed exceeded private construction for all of the 15 years between 1933 and 1948. That was a public policy choice, and the state was clear about it and clear and open in its objectives. It was during that same period that the Swedish Social Democrats enunciated a remarkable political ideal, the Folkemet, or in English, the people's home. It is a phrase that contains within it the idea of home as a political community, as a set of solidaristic relationships, not unlike in their period when the setting of the Irish clock on or Bayer. And it is one that in its policy implementation demanded and continues to demand the provision of homes as a matter of right for all the people. In this age of the Anthropocene, I believe that no, not only that ideal of home as a political community, committed to a rights-based vision of justice, can be sustained, but that it must be sustained. And to do so, however, our horizons cannot simply be confined to a single territorially defined political community. We, all of us on this planet, share what Pope Francis has termed our common home. And if we are to meet the challenges presented to this common home, we are obliged to widen our perspective of home to encompass all the people of this earth. For in the 21st century, there can be no partial solidarity, whether national solidarity or European solidarity. We require now an international solidarity, shorn of national antagonisms, open and willing to cooperate where we can and sacrifice where we must. For Europe, this may well be another century of the immigrant, a reversal of the great outflow to the new world and colonies ex that colonies experienced in the 19th century. This is not only a moral or political argument, but a practical one. Birth rates are falling below replacement levels across the European Union, and an ongoing necessity for immigration to support our economies in the global north will continue to draw people to our shores. But then, too, given the current trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions, Despite all the promises of the Paris Climate Agreement, there will be millions of people seeking refuge as they are today from environmental degradation and the depletion of natural resources. Our capacity for solidarity will be tested, is tested, and it will be measured by our willingness to welcome those fleeing climate disaster, 
war and persecution. Many of the challenges we confront are those which test our capacity for and willingness to engage in collective deliberation, mind work, to discern the common good and the collective action that is needed to achieve it. Looking back then, the history of the indigenous peoples of the world is their testament to our human ability to forge collective conceptions of home conceptions upon which collective institutions of government and governments can be built. And looking forward, let us recall and draw on the best ideals available to us, not only from our collective past, but also from the instincts of our heart and humanity. And let us imagine together a shared future for all the peoples of what must be our common home. Gurumila Mahagita. President Higgins, I cannot imagine a better researched, more erudite, more enlightening, more auspicious beginning to our first thought strand of the Galway Arts Festival. And I thank you on my own behalf, on behalf of the festival, on behalf of your obviously wonderfully enthusiastic audience here today. You took us not just from the origin of the species right up to last week, <laughs> But you brought us from the global to the international, to the national, to the local. You did a fantastic job of outlining the philosophical ideas of home that you have so brilliantly researched in the course of this. A bibliography would be very welcome. Um, and you also demonstrated, as always, and, and greatly to my delight, your interest and your knowledge of both women's history and labor history as huge uh, parts of the, the human story. Um, we, must, we must be blessed to have a president who is able to deliver a lecture like this, having been asked to do it a month ago. Now, alas, time has caught up with us. Uh, we had to move this session into this beautiful large hall because of the huge demand from yourselves to come and hear our president. So we are now absolutely at time and we won't be able to do a Q&A. The president's books are for sale in the hall if people would like to buy them. I'm sure there'll be bibliographies in that that will help you to keep up with, with the, the extraordinary firework-like thinking that we got exposed to this morning. So uh, I'm going to ask you now to be upstanding again uh, to allow for the departure of our president and his wife, Sabina Higgins. <laughs> Sorry. Rebecca, I'm sorry. It was lovely. Oh, it was lovely.